medical, but you actually also work in hospice care, is my understanding. You work with the elderly. We're being told around the world by scientists that really predominantly these health issues you've described very well and different reasons they may be caused, but not only is pollution part of it, but it's predominantly affecting people over the age of 65 with other comorbidities. I ask myself, you know, 20 years ago, would we have just called these deaths old age? You know, in some ways, are we just putting a mic, you know, like defining something like people talk about this. We've never looked at flu like this. We've never test kitted, you know, millions of people to see who actually got the flu. There's been a large, you know, a, a large amount of science is just assumptions. Now we're, you know, drilling down at it. You have scientists around the world, virologists, mathematicians, all saying, if we had done this with the flu, we could have made you panicked over the last, you know, 20 years. We could, we could show you this death rate every time and make it specific to an illness and freak everybody out. The media is a giant part of this. But, but specifically, because, you know, you have worked with the care of elderly. I'm sure they're very concerned. Um, what is it, you know, what is the message there? Should we be afraid of dying as we get older? I have a mother-in-law who I, I am worried about in New York. I think New York's handling this in a terrible way. I think that you don't want to end up in a New York hospital. They're going to vent you, it seems. They're still stuck on that crazy approach, you know, but I want her to feel safe. What is it that, you know, those that are over the age of 65 in that, what should we know about this? And specifically to that really small group, they're experiencing a much higher, you know, rate of, of an acute reaction. These are great questions. So um, age is interesting. Um, and um, if you look at the average age of death and, and this current pandemic as we track it, um, northern Italy is um, six to eight years older than southern Italy. And so and it's one of the oldest you know, countries in, in the world. Its average age is around 49 years of age. The United States and China are about 36 years of age. So we're 13 years younger as a population. And so when you see the United States having the highest death toll from this thing anywhere else in the world now, you need to ask, what is going on with the United States? Why is the United States apparently older biologically than it is chronologically? Why is China... Uh, at the same age, average age, or you know, many European countries uh, s similar age uh, to you know uh, our country. Why are we dying more? And the answer is pretty obvious. When you when you rank in chronic disease or or health outcomes, everything from neonatal death all the way to end of end of life things, the United States ranks 35th in the world by the most you know friendly measurements from the government. Watchdog organizations think that we might rank closer to, to 46th or something in the world, but we're somewhere between 35th and, and 49th in the world. So we're, um, we're the tail end of all modern societies. We are we're the, at the very bottom of, of bottom of the list. So if you look at the top economies and industrialized nations, we're dead last of health outcomes. And so why is the United States dying and why do we have so many examples of younger people dying? It's because we are sicker than any other nation. And so specific to this COVID, it turns out that we know that the coronavirus, both the common cold as well as these you know, more severe versions of it in, in SARS, MERS, and COVID, binds to a receptor in the lung uh, that's called that's called ACE2, and so this ACE2 receptor uh, is is expressed naturally on our lung surfaces. As we age, ACE2 can go up, especially if there's respiratory disease. So COPD, for example, has very high ACE2 expression along the surface. We have lots of channels in, and COPD is one of the only lung conditions that that puts you at increased risk of death uh, from this. The, all the rest of them are vascular, right? It's cardiovascular renal disease, um, uh, coronary uh, uh, disease, uh, and cerebral vascular disease. These can end diabetes uh, and the like. If you look at those comorbidities that people are dying from and their relationship to this ACE2 receptor, it gets pretty interesting because ACE2 goes up naturally in, in lung tissue from, from damage from emphysema type things with COPD, but not in cardiovascular disease until you add two drugs. And so when you add a statin drug, suddenly the whole system upregulates ACE2 receptors. 
When you add an ACE inhibitor, which is our leading number one recommendation from all medical societies, if you have diabetes, heart disease, or chronic kidney disease, the first drug you're supposed to be on, and you, could, you can get sued for malpractice if you don't have a patient on one of these drugs, is an ACE inhibitor. If they don't tolerate an ACE inhibitor, the most common co side effect of ACE inhibitors is cough because you've upregulated the ACE2 you know, in, wow. in their lungs, and now they're reacting to their environment abnormally. So if they develop an ACE inhibitor cough, which means you've changed the balance of their reactivity to their environment, then you need to put them on an ARB, which is an a, a angiotensin receptor blocker, which again upregulates ACE2 receptors. And so ACE inhibitors and ARBs are now seen to be a major risk factor for death from COVID. Why? Because it upregulates the, the ACE2 receptor. And so the United States is the most medicalized system. So yes, we have high disease, chronic disease rates. And in response to those chronic diseases, we put on medications that are, we know are putting you at risk of dying from coronavirus. So if we had a true public health organization that was really concerned about the next few months of death from a coronavirus that just got discovered over in Wuhan province, the very first thing we should have done is announce, doctors, you need to transition all your patients who are on ACE inhibitors over a calcium channel blocker or some other form of blood pressure control, or hey, maybe put them on a healthy diet. But regardless, take <laughs> them off the ACE inhibitor. If we had done that, we would have saved thousands of lives. Take them off the statin, there's no, the, the absolute risk of, of dying from a heart attack by taking somebody off a statin is near zero for a three month, six month period. And so take them off of their statin, put them on a, on a healthy plant-based diet so their cholesterol doesn't go up, and then take them off their ACE inhibitor. If we had done that, we would have completely changed the death toll in the United States. We knew that these drugs increase ACE2, and we knew based on SARS, MERS, and the, the common cold corona, that it binds the ACE2 to receptor. If we had done that, we would have saved thousands of lives all over the country, not to mention all over the world. And then we should have stopped influenza vaccination because an extraordinary study came out in 2017 showing that if we vaccinate for flu, your risk of getting coronavirus the following year goes up. And this is not just corona, but six other common respiratory viruses, their risk goes up. And this is commonly seen. This is a not. This is a, a well-described scientific phenomenon that if you get exposed to the real influenza, you develop what's what's called kind of this transverse immunity, where you get immunity to bugs that aren't even represented in influenza. You get this this immune system intelligence, and you will now become resistant to other bugs. If you don't get flu and you're, you're exposed to an abnormal protein within that flu virus, and so you have to mount a weird antibody to that, so you can't get your normal herd type or, or kind of immune system response to the environment, then you get increased risk of this. So what we should have done is if we really believed that this thing was 10 times more deadly than flu, if we, well, actually they said at the beginning it was 100 times more deadly than right. flu. If they really believed that, then in December they should have frozen all the influenza vaccines. Said no more influenza vaccines, come off your ACE inhibitor and your ARB and your statin drug, don't get influenza vaccine, we're going to cruise through this season because we have a, a new strain. We didn't do any of those things. We know that science. NIH knows that science, CDC knows that science. We did not make public health moves to protect the community from coronavirus. Why? I think we kind of knew, well, I knew right away, just because I have a calculator. Anybody with a calculator, as soon as the first cruise ship stopped in Oakland, we knew everything we needed to know about this virus. Had, that nobody died on that ship. For 14 days, they were quarantined on that ship. It has a five-day infectious period you will develop symptoms in five days if you're going to develop symptoms at all. And so we should have seen high amounts of blue people and, and, and you know, liver failure and all of that on that ship because it was the worst population you could possibly isolate because right. they had an average age over 70 on that ship. And, and there were children running around. So you've got children, which are the, the best microbiome uh, swappers outside of dogs. Dogs are, are, are definitely our best, but kids are this awesome gift that they're so, so good at microbial communication. And so you've got kids running around the ship, you've got old people, they're sequestered, and they didn't, and they didn't sequester. They, they didn't quarantine those patients away from each other in those initial uh, couple of weeks. Uh, and, and so it should have been massive death toll on that ship, and yet nobody was even critically, I think one or two people came off critically ill, the rest of the 3,700 people uh, weren't, weren't even, there was only 100 or so that were showing symptoms at the end of the 14 days. 
A few people weeks later died, and we said they died of coronavirus. Coronavirus was definitely in their in their experience. It was present. May have contributed in some way, unmasking toxicity of their statin drugs and their you know ACE inhibitors and their flu vaccine that they got. But ultimately, we knew that the death toll on that ship was low enough that if we extrapolate over the United States, we would see somewhere around a death toll of 0.1 percent, maybe 0.3 percent at worst. And we know that flu can, you know, in 2017 was causing a 7 percent mortality rate. So we knew at the beginning that this was not uh, going to be some massively fatal thing unless we managed it wrong. And we did. Instead of learning from the past, we, we treated this like this was a vicious virus and every death that happened got blamed on corona instead of our mindset. Our mindset of physicians that this is respiratory failure and I need to put this patient on a respiratory, that's the mind, that mindset was killing people. We weren't responding to the real things below our fingertips because as physicians, frankly, we have been brainwashed away from using our eyes, our nose, our fingers, and our sense, sensory system to look at a patient. We don't believe anything until it comes through a serologic laboratory study or an MRI machine. If we don't do those two things, we, don't, we have not been given permission to have any trust in our own intuition, our own massive capacity for quantum co computation and intelligent decision making. That's been taken away from us and we're threatened with lawsuits if you don't have the MRI and serologic data to back up your plan. We can't move, we are paralyzed as a medical system paralyzed by the fear of doing the wrong thing, doing something outside of the current paradigm. And so for that, we are losing our patients. And so next winter, all of the physicians answering, knowing what you know, what are you going to do next fall? Are you going to vaccinate your patient? Because we know there's probably one more season where we'll see COVID in the environment. It takes two years for, for these coronaviruses to leave. By the way, know that this will be gone. Again, I said it earlier in the show, but it's very important America world. This virus will be gone by next summer. And when they come out with a vaccine next year, they're gonna say that the vaccine eliminated the virus. Okay. That is physiologically impossible. That is scientifically impossible. And it has never happened with the previous coronaviruses that have circulated. So let us not be this easily duped, okay? Right. Another show we can talk about whether I believe in vaccines or not. I think that there is an intelligent way we could go about understanding vaccines in the future. But since 1986, you know better than anybody else, right. we have not been testing for efficacy and safety of our vaccines. So are vaccines important? Is Zach against vaccines? No, Zach is fully for an intelligent microbiome informed new model for childhood immunity and vaccination. That's what I want people to sign on to. And so as an invitation on the tail end of this film will be an invitation to go to my website and, and, and sign a petition as a physician or scientist to sign up for healthy child immunity and intelligent vaccination. We need to bring the, the new science of the last 30 years to the microbiome to update our understanding of our relationship to the microbiome. And we need to stop seeing ourselves at war with it. We need to see ourselves as an ecologic member. Uh, we are a member within this microbial community. We are an ecosystem in and of ourselves. And we need to now advance the science of vaccination to understanding that exquisite role of microbes in our genome, microbes in our immune system responsiveness, microbes in our capacity to adapt and resist cancer and the chronic diseases that are truly threatening life on Earth. Just, just we